You're listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast, where ONS Voices Talk Cancer, a resource from the Oncology Nursing Society. Through conversations with subject matter experts, we examine the important issues in oncology nursing, from new treatments to patient-centered research to advancements in clinical practice. Join us as we hear from nurses in all facets of oncology care, from benchside to bedside and everywhere in between. Welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. I'm your host, Stephanie Jardine, Oncology Clinical Nurse Specialist at ONS. And today we are joined by ONS member, Kathy Ollum, Clinical Nurse Specialist and Nurse Educator, retired from Miami Cancer Institute, Baptist Health South Florida, and retired member of the ONS Miami-Dade chapter to discuss the Oncology Academy, which she developed for experienced nurses entering the oncology field. Thank you for joining me, Kathy. Thank you, Stephanie, for extending the invitation. To start us off, why is caring for patients with cancer different from other populations? Cancer patients are unique because there's so many different types of cancer, multiple complex treatment avenues, and It has an extensive impact on physical, emotional, spiritual, and financial health on that individual and their family. For most part, the patient is not just one and done with their cancer treatment, but it's a lifelong journey. There's many misconceptions about cancer, which breed fear and despair. Thank you. That's definitely something different from patients who go in for an elective surgery or a minor issue that might come up. So what is Oncology Academy and why did you develop it? The Academy came about to fill the need of bringing nurses into oncology specialty and give them the education and resources to safely and competently care for patients with cancer in the outpatient setting. And although I've been orienting nurses to inpatient and outpatient oncology since 2005, the work for specific Oncology Academy began around 2013, 2014, and has been a continuous process ever since. In my early years as an educator, I began assisting my colleagues in teaching the two-day ONS chemotherapy biotherapy certification course, and then continued to be an instructor through the transition to the online course format. During that time, we hit a few road bumps, and I felt that my nurses coming into oncology needed formal foundational learning with a contextual component before attempting the ONS chemotherapy biotherapy certificate course. So the initial academy components developed consisted of the foundational courses that included cancer biology, treatment types with a heavy emphasis on chemotherapy and biotherapy safe administration, management of complications related to those treatments, as well as oncologic emergencies and the many psychosocial aspects of cancer care. Fast forward that to 2017 and the need to train a large number of nurses in a limited amount of time in order to fill the needs of of Miami Cancer Institute's quickly growing patient population we chose experienced nurses who wanted to transition to outpatient oncology. That is wonderful. I think that your recognition of that need and just acknowledging the fact that even new nurses coming into new GNs and coming right out of school have limited education in oncology and just the foundational practices. So after probably several years in nursing practice, not in oncology, just even to have a review of that information was going to be so important for those nurses that you were looking to transition into the oncology field and practice where you were. Yes, it was. So what are, were the processes for developing it and then implementing it into practice? Well, the development process was multifaceted, Stephanie. Historically, the process of onboarding a nurse new to oncology and becoming fully functioning as a competent or proficient clinician took months to years. How could we shorten this process without compromising safety? So applying Dr. Patricia Benner's position that nurses grow through experiential learning when nurses who are already proficient, advanced, or experts in another nursing specialty take less time to orient and become independent and competent to oncology. So that was our our basis of what we wanted to look at, what we wanted to prove. 
And the second task was to definitely determine what requirements of oncology nursing education were. What are those requirements? So we looked to the standards and we looked to the regulatory associations. Those included Oncology Nursing Society Joint Commission, Commission on Cancer, COPE, FACT, and APBC and other bodies. And a list of education requirements and competencies was established from, from what their requirements were. After that, we did an extensive inventory of what was already available at our institution. And that included online management learning systems. So many places already have things like HealthStream. We called it Baptist University. So going into that and looking at what we had and what we could use. But implementing into practice took the buy-in from key stakeholders and the participation of in-house subject matter experts. So you can't do this alone. We um, developed a formal interview process. We, we did advertise this academy. And of course, the formal interview process consisted of predetermined discussion questions that covered critical thinking, problem solving, teamwork, integrity, and com- passion, as well as a commitment to a full attendance of this 12-week process. So if you wanted into this academy, there would be no weddings. There would be no vacations. This is going to be intense, and that was relayed to our applicants at that time, which most were agreeable to. Again, the structure of the academy consisted of a 12-week program. The first three to four weeks were didactic, so we had in-class Zoom learning So not only were the foundational subjects taught, but we also brought in subject matter experts to bring oncology as a totality there. So many times nurses in in infusion really don't have a deep understanding of what goes on in radiation or blood and marrow transplant or what the navigators do, what is in clinical research. So we brought those subject matter experts in and gave two to four hour short workshops on those as well. And then, of course, we had our skills determination. So what essential skills were needed? So we determined, of course, IB skills. So many institutions now, nurses don't start their own IVs anymore. In a busy outpatient setting, most cases, there's not an IV team. So you're responsible for not only your IVs, your central lines, your port access and care, and plus your different types of administration, the pumps that we use, those type of technical skills. And then once that was completed, that was done in about four weeks, they had the background to be able to sit for that ONS chemotherapy immunotherapy certificate course. Once that was uh, successfully completed, and again, we had 100% successful completion, they were transitioned into their assigned units. So infusion, radiation, BMT, and so forth. And there they had their preceptors and their unit-specific competencies that in all cases, everyone completed within the 12 weeks. That is a very intense program, but it sounds amazing and a wonderful way in which you really looked at and took the standards and both for oncology from ONS and just the nursing standards of what those basic or foundational levels of where they should start and where what they should know to get them in the position that they would be competent and safe and feel comfortable in the skills that they were doing. So you talked a lot about those different pieces. And one of the other things that I really liked about the way that you built this program is how you brought in those specialty areas, because you're right, even when you have new nurses going on and they go to a directly to maybe, let's say, a surgical onc unit, and they might not really understand what some of those other specialty areas, such as the radiation or the transplant, do and how those work. And I think that's a really interesting and great way to expose folks to what all the different roles are within the oncology specialty. What was an unintended good result of that, Stephanie, was the camaraderie that it made within the organization because Miami Cancer Institute is this huge, huge building. And of course, there's so many patients, so many clinics going on at one time. And and if you didn't meet these people head on in your education process, you may never see them. So the camaraderie that it established within the inner departments was amazing. And I think that was a byproduct that we hadn't really intended, but it was a it was a good outcome. Oh, that's wonderful. I could see how that could be extremely helpful, even in looking at 
process improvement, you know, between different departments and things. And you just, like you said, the camaraderie and even just breaking down the barriers of the willingness to go and and talk to those folks and not being shy about reaching out to your colleagues in a different area. I think that's really wonderful how that worked out for you. So what are skills and knowledge that nurses can gain through this resource? You talked about some of the things, but are there any other specific areas that you could talk about? Well, the knowledge gain consisted of those evidence-based practices that allowed these nurses to provide competent and compassionate care from diagnosis through survivorship or death. So that was their continuity of care for this patient. So the skills were not only technical skills, because so many times... We do emphasize those technical skills, the critical thinking skills, the symptom management, the patient family education, the psychosocial assessments, and the interventions for those. That really brought them to life. The greatest gain was the confidence that the nurses obtained and the development of a passion for this oncology patient. What do nurse leaders need to know to develop a similar program at their institution? An extensive gap analysis should be performed to gauge where your program stands. What are the strengths? What are the deficits? According to what we already identified as the educational needs and the educational requirements of our accrediting bodies. Look at the quality indicators, the national patient safety indicators. How do we compare to national benchmarks? What is your extrapolation rate? Where are we at with that? In what direction is your, your organization going? which is going to be different for each type of organization. We still have many small oncology practices out there. Where are we going? We're seeing a trend that these small oncology practices are being absorbed into large hospital systems. So again, you need to know where you're going. What is the goal? And be part of the decision-making. And again, I want to emphasize that this academy didn't include new graduates. So there's a whole different area of information we can develop for where to bring new graduates into the outpatient setting. That's really a good point to make, that it's definitely a different kind of idea or maybe a different agenda schedule planning for new graduates versus experienced RNs, um, bringing them into this specialty area. Even just with the fact of they already bring some level of skill with them, but really focusing it on oncology and how, what the differences are for those nurses. What was the response to nurses applying for this program? Did you have full classes? Did they respond in an excited or positive way? Or how, how, what did you see happen? Well, the first offering, we had an overwhelming response. We did a several weeks for many hours we did interviews on these these nurses. We had a criteria. We had prepackaged questions that we did, and we wanted to look at their critical skills thinking. We wanted to look at the teamwork, but compassion was a really big one. And of course, there was a lot of interest. When Miami Cancer Institute first opened, we turned away nurses without oncology experience, and we turned them quite a few away. But as our institute grew, we had pretty much depleted South Florida's supply of oncology nurses, and, and we had to come up with how are we going to grow our own. So the response was overwhelming. There was only a few nurses that didn't really want to commit to the 12 weeks without our interruptions. It's like, oh, I have a cruise planned. Oh, I'm going to get married in that month or what have you. And then we always encourage them, come back and apply again. We're going to do this again in the in next year because we the first one was in the fall we kept the classes small because as a new oncology institute or cancer institute we didn't have a lot of the major key players in place as in me being the primary oncology educator so there was a lack of space automatically you'd think a brand new building would have a lot of classroom space but we filled up that space very very quickly And again, the fact that we wanted to keep it intimate, small and intimate. So nine nurses at a time is what I capped it at so that we could work in groups of threes and with the space that we had and the computers and and things like that, that was the ideal number. So at the time that the application for 
this past year's Congress submission, I had a total of 27 nurses that went through three different cohorts for this. That's wonderful. The Oncology Academy was awarded an Association of Community Cancer Centers Innovator Award for 2020. Can you describe the qualifications and criteria for the award? And in what ways is the Oncology Academy innovative? It's kind of a surprise because after submitting the abstract to ONS, I was pretty excited just to be able to be included in the 2020 Congress. And then we became aware of the uh, Association of Community Cancer Centers Innovator Award. And my nurse scientist, Noah, he went ahead and, and did that application. Now, the application process for this award consisted of describing innovative and replicable solutions in the area of nurse training and the model that we used. It had to demonstrate real world impact on the delivery of cost effective patient centered care. So what advice do you have for nurses entering the field of oncology? The advice I would have for them is don't become, don't expect to become an expert overnight. There's a learning curve regardless of your background and experience. So you've got to give yourself time, but also be willing to be put in the work. Nurses have often expressed the frustration at the number of chemotherapy, immunotherapy agents and regimens that we give in a daily basis. And I tell them, don't expect to memorize these things. They are constantly changing, but know where your resources are and how to use them effectively. That definitely is, I think, one of the things that is probably so overwhelming for new nurses coming into oncology is just the the treatment and not only the vast number of different treatments that are out there, but as well as the speed at which new ones come into market as well as um, or new treatments become available for patients. So Kathy, what advice do you have for nurse educators and resources when they're getting ready to train future oncology nurses? The greatest advice I can give for oncology educators is always go to the evidence. Evidence-based resources are at your fingertips, the best being the ONS chemotherapy immunotherapy guidelines for practice, the 2016 ONS ASCO safety guidelines. You've got the ONS oncology nurse generalist competencies, the standards and scope of practice, and many, many ONS textbooks. Also include a class based on evidence-based education and adopt the model for your practice. Format your education program so it leads into certification and then include oncology education advancements in your clinical ladders and your merit evaluation processes. Another point I'd like to express uh, to the educators that I learned from my mentor, Dr. Diane McKenzie, is to prove your value. Start with a gap analysis. Look to the required education competency components, establish and record your own data, such as pre and post testing. And what positive impact does uh, your education program have on quality indicators, nurse turnover, and patient satisfaction? As far as other resources, American Cancer Society has uh, resources for clinicians and patients. Leukemia Lymphoma Society, the NCCN guidelines, and of course, our pharmaceutical industry partners have many educational programs that include the agents and disease specific information. One that we overlook that uh, needs to be brought to the forefront is ELNIC. That organization has extensive education around uh, death and dying. Thank you. Those are all really great resources and important information for those educators that are looking to develop a program such as the one that you all created. So a question about your course, can nurses outside of your organization apply to go to your course? No, that course was for uh, Miami Cancer Institute nurses at that time. What I would like to see is maybe we can do this through ONS or through another platform. The ONS nurse educators in the community, the response was overwhelming. And right now I'm in the process of formatting and packaging the work so that I could share it through the community webpage. But I really think that this is something that maybe as educators, we could work together and make it a, a program accessible to all. 
that would be a great goal for the future. That is a great idea. So as we're trying to wrap it up here, what is something about oncology nursing and nurse education that's not often discussed, but you wish people knew more about? I would like to emphasize that the field of oncology is constantly evolving, and it's essential to reevaluate and modify your education program and do it frequently. Once every two or three years is not enough because the information changes. Ongoing nursing education is essential. Performing annual learning needs assessments along with needed and required annual education should be part of your oncology education program. And then nurse educators, especially oncology nurse educators, are very busy educating others, but rarely have time to work on their own education and development beyond academia. We need a foundation and a format for this process. And then, of course, I want to encourage oncology educators and oncology nurses to be change agents for our profession. We need to work together and share our information and ideas so we can continue to grow and be at the cutting edge of everything that's coming about in oncology. Thank you. And Kathy, this is such an amazing program that you all have developed and put together and have such insights that you're sharing with all of us today. Do you have any final comments that you would like to share with us? Well, I want to thank you for this opportunity to share the work and hopefully we can continue this dialogue and continue the work as a professional organization. I can be reached. I have no problem with you sharing my email address and my contact information. And again, with anything I can help any of the educators out there with, I'd be more than happy to be part of the discussion. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Tell us about your favorite part of this episode by leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts. For more resources and information about oncology nursing, visit us at ons.org or voice.ons.org.